not the first person to notice this trend, uh, but it is something that has been pretty zeitgeisty for a while now. I've noticed it in very popular movies and television shows and video games, and uh, it is the phenomena of the reconciling with your parents narrative, which I think is uh, interesting only in as much as it seems overrepresented in very popular media. Um, maybe more so in, in, than in times past, or more so than I can remember in other popular media. Um, and what got me thinking about this was uh, Steven Universe, of course. Uh, I, I've ranted about Steven Universe before and sort of given explanations, one in an episode with Dono, but um, I would like to go into it uh, deeper into into the world of Steven Universe because uh, I like it a lot. I really like the show. I think uh, it's interesting uh, that it has a lot of baggage associated with it. You know, it has uh, some famously zealous fans uh, who, who get uh, who are very specific. Um, but um, I I think just the show on its own without any sort of you know, meta narrative or reaction or fan community to it, I think is a very decent show. But I, I think it is sort of emblematic. And I don't think um I I don't think it um started this whole trend, but it comes very early on the crest of these these narratives about forgiving your parents. Um before I go off about Steven Universe, I I wanna first quote an article uh by Emily St. James, who writes for Vox, uh, and she noticed this trend a while ago in the context of everything, everywhere, all at once, uh, which is, of course, a movie about reconciling with your parents. Um, and, uh, you know, say what you will about Vox, you know, their political takes, I don't know about their, their politics stuff, but uh, Emily's been a, a, a great film critic for years and years and years, and, uh, you know, she's got insight. Uh, so this article starts off, I'm just going to read from it. Hollywood's hot new trend, parents who say they're sorry. This was from last year. This was from April 25th, 2022, when everything everywhere all at once was hitting really big. It was, uh, it was its moment in the sun, you know, it was winning Oscars and such. Although, no, I guess it won that this year, but, um, or last year, I can't keep time straight. Anyway. The article goes on. Everything, everywhere, all at once, and turning red are part of a burgeoning subgenre, the millennial parental apology fantasy. Uh, Emily St. James, senior correspondent. Spoilers for everything, everywhere, all at once. Of course, there's going to be spoilers. If you haven't seen the movie, uh, my opinion on the movie, it's fine. You know, it's not my favorite thing in the world. I'm glad something like it is winning awards as opposed to, you know, The Blind Side or something like that. This is obviously, you know, a, a, a much more deserving movie to get that kind of recognition. But, uh, uh, you know, what, whatever I think of the film, it is very emblematic, and how popular it was is very emblematic of this trend. So let's continue. Jobu Tupaki, the main villain of the film Everything Everywhere All at Once, has seen the vast and infinite multiverse. She has experienced countless lives. Unimpressed with what she's seen, she has constructed an enormous bagel that is seemingly capable of destroying everything, everywhere, all at once. This movie is very weird. Uh, the other characters within the film wonder what Jobu, played wonderfully by Stephanie Sue, is searching for. But the answer will likely suggest itself to the audience from the moment we hear the character's origin story. Jobu used to be from a place the film refers to as the Alpha Universe. She was a girl named Joy, or in the film's parlance, Alpha Joy. And her mother, Alpha Evelyn, Michelle Yeoh, broke Alpha Joy's brain in pursuit of the endless possibilities inherent in the multiverse. It's a metaphor for parental abuse that isn't even a metaphor. Turning your child into a science experiment to further your own ambitions is a deeply, horrifically abusive thing to do. And Jobu's spreading of that pain outward from herself is an evocative depiction of how cycles of abuse perpetuate themselves. The movie takes place across many, many universes. However, our protagonist and point-of-view character is a different Evelyn, 
one who isn't a brilliant scientist, instead a frustrated Chinese immigrant who owns a laundromat in the Los Angeles area and is facing a tax audit. She isn't abusive to her joy, but she isn't a good mom by any means. She's way too critical, and she's deeply uncomfortable with Joy's long-term relationship with another woman. Yet these are offenses, the film argues, that could be overcome with a sincere apology and an attempt to do better. Maybe. As such, Jobu meeting protagonist Evelyn will hopefully allow both to find some way to move forward together and forget the past. Maybe. Everything Everywhere falls into a suddenly popular subgenre of film I call the Millennial Parental Apology Fantasy, alongside a host of other movies, most of them animated. See also Pixar's Turning Red, Encanto, and The Mitchells and the Machines, among others. And that's just in the last 12 months. Instead of telling the time-honored story of a child learning just how much their parent has sacrificed for them, these stories tell its mirror image. Instead, they are stories where the parent has to realize how badly they've treated their child. The ability to heal intergenerational trauma lies at least in part with that parent, and as the film wraps up, they take real steps to doing so, usually as the child realizes that the trauma did not originate with their parent, but much further up the family tree. Better able to understand each other, the parent and child, and the film with a better relationship. Everything Everywhere takes that basic storytelling framework and stretches it uh, to its absolute breaking point. In the process, it becomes likely the best example of the burgeoning subgenre, and one that points to the limitations of parental apology fantasy stories to talk about the actual damage inter intergenerational drama can do to people. And all along, the movie understands that the fantasy of a parent who understands and accepts you as you are isn't just a fantasy for the child. It's one for the parent, too. Um... So this is a really long article that it goes on. That's just the first part of it. But uh, I, the reason why, uh, I guess I said Steven Universe was the big reason why I started thinking about this again. But it was also, uh, a, the game I've been replaying is Hades, which is also a fantasy about <laughs> reconciling with your parents and getting your family back together, uh, you know which greatly massages the story of Hades and Persephone, because if it was one-to-one -one with the actual myth, the video game probably would have been a bit more uncomfortable. Um, but, um, yeah, I, I, I want to talk about Steven Universe, too, because as Emily observes, this is sort of like a... It's a frequent uh, subject in animated shows, and especially with, a, like, a lot of the ones she lists, animated shows that seem to have this very sort of devoted and zealous audience this sort of this fantasy is is becomes very important to people you know in the same way that everything everywhere all at once had a very devoted and zealous audience um i think there is something about this fantasy which gets to the core of a deep desire that is i think in most cases unattainable i, I shouldn't say that it is possible to reconcile with your parents but I mean, the the inherent limitations of a movie or a television show is that that process is is messy and it takes a really long time and there is no real sudden aha moment. But because, you know, you're, you're doing this in a movie, it, there has to be like that moment of realization and sort of the turnaround. And, you know, there has to be that big uh, that big denouement where, where, uh, they are gifted with self-awareness and self-awareness for someone like that doesn't happen li like that. It happens just over the course of making mistakes and trying over again. So, you know, because of inherent limitations of the mediums, I get why, you know, it's not doing a like super realistic version of how you come to reconcile with your parents. But, um, I, I think, uh, I, I think more interesting than that is the fact that why why is this? And I think Emily probably uh, gives some reasons in the article as to why she thinks uh, this is such a popular thing amongst our uh, uh, amongst our current in our current zeitgeist. But um, before all of those movies that she lists, before all of those animated features, what came before was Steven Universe, which is like the ultimate parental apology fantasy or it's like <laughs> it's i guess i shouldn't describe it that way but it's sort of like what if you didn't just need your parents to apologize but you needed to get them to stop doing genocide as well which is another thing um and i guess i started thinking about this because uh i had a comic where i did steven universe versus hitler 
and it <laughs> it, it it became very popular. Um, but um, because there's like a lot of discourse surrounding the cartoon, you know, there was some inevitable backlash to it by Steven Universe fans. One of which was like, uh, "I cannot believe this person would depict who Rebecca Sugar is Jewish, and they would never have Steven Universe forgive Hitler." I was like, oh, "I'm sorry, <laughs> you know, I don't. I'm sorry. I'm trying to be try to make a joke. It's not supposed to be real to the <laughs> fiction of the universe, but you know, whatever." Um, and I wanted to say a few things. I, I do think, you know, it's a pretty old joke about Steven Universe at the time that, uh, if you've never seen it, I'm going to spoil Steven Universe for you. Just give an overview of the plot. Steven is a half gem, half human. Uh, his, his mother was a gem. They're this group of sentient space rocks that project light forms out of their gems and, uh, they... Uh, initially came to Earth looking to dominate it, but upon seeing the beauty of the planet, Stephen's mother, uh, who at the beginning of the series we know as Rose Quartz, uh, led a rebellion of sympathetic gems to stop the more rapacious gems from uh, permanently destroying Earth for resource extraction, which is what the gem, the gem empire, the gem empire seeks to do. Basically, they are big things... They believe that they are superior because of how, you know, big and uh, they have this uh, sense of superiority or at least this sort of colonial desire to do uh, intergalactic resource extraction. And they'll mine all the resources from planets and kill them if left to their own devices. So Stephen's mother uh, leads this rebellion against the other gems. Um, in the process, she supposedly shatters pink diamond who is the emissary to earth and one of the four powerful diamonds who are the the figureheads in in this gem empire and so that's how that's sort of the backstory of the series but a lot of the series is steven universe who's this boy it's it's sort of like this it's uh, derives heavily from a lot of like magical girl stuff or like uh, especially like revolutionary girl utina is like very influential on the show, which if you haven't seen Revolutionary Girl Lutina, you should watch that shit. It's really good. Um, anyway, uh, Steven Universe, he's a boy, he's lovable, he plays a ukulele, but not in an annoying way, because, you know, his dad is his dad is Greg, who is like the best dad ever. He's played by WFMU guy Tom Sharpling. I mean, that's how you can automatically tell that Steven Universe has a little more going on than just its sort of reputation for softness is that it hired tom frickin sharpling rebecca sugar knows what good comedy is she's, she's down with good she's down with the best show you know that should give you an inkling as how there has kind of some cool bona fides backing it and tom sharpling does a great job i love the character of greg universe he's a instantly lovable uh he has a skullet you know he's uh he's got like sun he's sunburned he runs a car wash he evidently loves his son, and he has this, like, very sort of, um, because the show, you know, it's it subverts ideas about gender roles all the time. Uh, Greg takes sort of an untraditionally uh, masculine approach to raising Stephen. You know, he, he is a typical dad, and he has dad humor, but he's, you know, he's, like, not violent. He's, like, very gentle. And that's like one of the I to me that's my favorite relationship in the show is just like Steven hanging out with his dad. Um, those episodes are usually pretty fun uh, because he also he's just like a normal guy too who has been thrust into these circumstances and it's Tom Sharpling and he's just got this in instantly lovable voice. So yeah, I think uh, I think uh, uh, <laughs> I don't that's off an attention. But so Steven also lives with uh, the Crystal Gems, who are this essentially superhero group. Uh, Garnet, who's who's cool and collected. Amethyst, who's sort of childish and brash. And Pearl, who's uptight. Eventually they add more. A lot of the episodes are them uh, sort of dealing with corrupted gems, who are uh, uh, gems that have turned into monsters because they're cracked or that they have something wrong with them. You know, there's, there's something that is turning them into monsters. And uh, um, eventually, you know, the show is a lot of day-to-day -day of them doing these fights uh, and also hanging out with the denizens of the local town, 
uh, which was uh, based on the beaches of Delaware uh, that uh, Rebecca Sugar spent her childhood on, which is based on like Rehoboth Beach. Uh, the the town is named Beach City, and a lot of the episodes of Steven Universe are just them hanging out, and that provides like uh, the, some of the. Uh, those are frequently also the best episodes, is where they're just doing something, and there's no, it's not about the overarching plot or the big diamond war, or the big epic stuff. It's just you know. They, they Stephen and Amethyst uh, become wrestlers, and Stephen becomes Tiger Millionaire. <laughs> Millionaire, a very funny episode. Um, and uh, yeah, those those that's what's a pretty good aspect of the show. But um, I think what the show became known for is that it's really weepy. You know, even the show parodies itself uh, in with the 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 show that Stephen watches in the show is called Crying Friends, or I forget exactly what it's called, but the joke is that all of these cute animated characters are crying all the time. And the show is, you know, making a joke about itself, how it's a pretty, particularly weepy show, but that's what it's good for too. You know, it goes to some very strong emotional places. Um, and it's some really fucked up ones too. Yeah. There's one where Amethyst is arguing with Greg about the legacy of Rose Quartz. Uh, and Amethyst then turns into Rose Quartz because the gems have shape-shifting abilities because they're light projections and is tormenting Greg with the image of his dead wife, which is like, when I saw that, for I can't believe this isn't a fucking children's show. This is really fucked up and intense for, for a children's show. I guess that's uh, what I should also mention is that Stephen literally is his mother because of the way that gem reproduction works. Stephen is this combination between flesh and light and his mother transformed into him in order to give him life so he's got that orphan like quality eventually and these are the big spoilers i'm going to reveal throughout the show we we realize that rose quartz didn't destroy pink diamond but rather she is pink diamond and um she through through witnessing the beauty of earth and through, you know, meeting the correct people at the correct time, you know, meeting Garnet, uh, who is a combination of a, a ruby and a sapphire, which is a forbidden love on the sort of pseudo-fascistic gem planet, uh, you know, she becomes more emboldened to reject the, the order of the gems. And uh, so, yeah, she becomes the revolutionary. She fights against them. But she is also burdened with these traumatic memories of what she did and what she was complicit in you know and Stephen receives these memories and he's frequently burdened by them you know he wants to believe his mother is a good person uh throughout the series but he's always confronted with the fact that she's done terrible things and it's viscerally bad for Stephen because in in some ways he is her he physically has uh, taken on her form more than uh you know you would from a, a regular flesh mother so he is he is especially burdened with these sort of epigenetic sense memories of the terrible things that uh pink diamond did before she uh learned how to be chill and um so yeah that's where the big crux of the narrative comes into is you have this epic conquest of Stephen at once trying to forgive and understand his powerful but abusive parent um, who wasn't really, a, I mean, Pink Diamond or Rose Quartz was never abusive to Stephen, but um, she was abusive to everyone else, you know, and it's, uh, and you are her. So, so it's like, how do you reconcile with a, you know, a parent that you know you are you you physically embody much more than a regular parent and you know how do you forgive them even after they've died which is sort of like a big question it asks and eventually you know steven is able to confront another parental figure when he uh, goes to the diamond planet and he meets white diamond the big the big ass diamond you know there's yellow diamond and blue diamond who are also these uh, sort of big imposing abusive matriarchal figures uh, you know, uh, Blue Diamond is like, uh, she gets people to cry with her when she's crying. You know, she's emotionally manipulative. Manipulative. Yellow Diamond, played by the inimitable Patty Lupone, uh, is, you know, sort of staunch and warlike and uh, bellicose and uh, sort of unfeeling. And they sort of represent those aspects of your quintessential bad mom. 
Uh, but then you get to White Diamond, who is this sort of gigantic Stepford wife um, who uh, <laughs> removes Stephen's soul <laughs> at, at one point. But then the big moment of revelation for White Diamond is Stephen reconstituting himself in a and his soul. And like the big ending of the regular, regular main series has this wonderful animated sequence by animation legend James Baxter who uh, gets Stephen to uh, eventually reunite and inspire the Diamonds to not do genocide anymore. Uh, and I, I think, yeah, a very common criticism of Steven Universe um, that I sort of played upon for the Steven Universe versus Hitler comic is that, oh, Steven Universe is about forgiving genociders or forgiving fascists because they're are aspects to gem society that market as sort of fascist or have that order and like uh, narrow in on out groups and uh you know it, it's uh there is i guess it can be interpreted that way but i think that's a fairly uncharitable interpretation because to me they're less fascists and they're more gods you know they're like the thing about fascists is that you can punch fascists to death you know uh, you you literally cannot punch the gems to death. You you cannot fight them that way. Your only ability, you, the only thing you can do is attempt to persuade them uh, to their better nature because y y the alternative is fighting them, which is physically impossible. It's like Galactus, you know? You have to defeat him not by, you know, hitting him with the most powerful thing, but by doing something clever or weird or s subverting it or something, you know? Because, um... Which is why I think it's sort of un unfair to compare them to fascists or say that, you know, Steven Universe is, is willing to forgive fascists uh, because, you know, it's not really what's going on in the show. It's about reconciling with God, who is your your abusive grandmother, <laughs> which is, is very funny. I mean, that's the thing is like the show... Uh, writ large is this is a Christ allegory like to a T like very very catholic show which is is funny to me you know it's it's funny that steven in the show is eventually revealed to be italian of italian descent his uh, uh greg's original name was demeo uh, <laughs> and that has a cameo by the voice of meatwad dave willis who's doing his carl voice yeah the show's good the steven universe is good people <laughs> it's a wonderful show um it's got it's got uh, it's Dave Willis doing this Carl voice from Aqua Teen Hunger Force in it. It's a, it's a very decent show, um, but yeah, uh, Steven Universe is it's about it's not about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. It's about the Mother, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. It's sort of a matriarchal take on uh, the the Christ allegory because uh, Pink Diamond, who is this God, you know, wants to see what Earth is like for herself. And the way she does this is by uh, putting herself in a flesh avatar that is also her. Um, and, uh, you know, Stephen also, he has a holy ghost in him. He's got a little pink holy ghost in him as well. So he is this sort of, he is this trinity of these spirits that are separate entities, but the same thing as well. Um, and he inevitably appeals to the bigger god, you know, to spare humans because he has seen their value and he has seen what they can do and he's seen the beauty and majesty of Earth. And, uh, you know, much in the same way that sort of... I don't know if this is like canon in the Bible, but it's like the New Testament God is much is a sort of a softer God. It's a much nicer God than Old Testament God, uh, who is all about sort of petty revenge mostly. Um and sort of, it seems like this this softening of God directly comes from the experience he has when he is a human, you know. Um, but, you know, it's interesting because, like, it, Stephen also is not God as well. He is not Pink Diamond, you know. He is, and, you know, at the end of the show, explicitly rejects the idea that he is, whereas, you know, Jesus eventually accepts that he is God. So there, I think there is this sort of, like, it's interesting that, a god in, you know, the Christ allegory wants to be human, but doesn't really fully commit to it because eventually he becomes a god in the end, whereas in Steven Universe, uh, he, he, the god more or less stays human and rejects the previous divinity that it once had, which is, I, I think, an interesting 
uh, an interesting take on it. But yeah, I, I think like um, this is uh, one of the best examples of the parental apology genre because it's like, what if your mom wasn't just abusive? What if your mom was space Hitler? <laughs> what, and there was no way to like physically defeat her. So you literally had to use the, the only way to do it was to use the power of love and understanding uh, in order to stop them from doing genocide. And, you know, if people have like the criticism of my Hitler comic, because they think that criticism is disingenuous, that's totally fair. I agree with you. But I think the idea of Steven Universe, you know, meeting Hitler and be like, it would change your mind. I think it's, I think it's so funny. I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, but also, you know, if I would try and justify that, you know, um, presumably in this fantasy scenario, he's meeting Hitler in like 1933 or a Hitler clone before he's done like the worst of the shit. <laughs> and he's tried to convince him before then. Um, but you know, eventually, and also what are you complaining about in the comic? They eventually decide to kill Hitler in the comic. It's not like Stephen forgives Hitler in the comic because Garnett gets to his better understanding. She's like, we have to kill him, Stephen. Stephen, we've got to kill Hitler. <laughs> oh yeah. Also like, uh, just as an aside tangent, uh, Estelle is really fucking funny in the Steven Universe show because every other character has this very exaggerated sort of like Disney Channel-esque like, uh, the other character actors, Michaela Dietz and like Dee Dee Manuel Hall came from like Broadway and like uh, Michaela Dietz was on Barney. So they're giving these like really broad, like sort of like excited, uh, exaggerated cartoon readings, which stands in contrast to Estelle, who reads every line in her like signature deadpan voice. And, uh, and it just kills because she just contrasts with everyone else. Even like Tom Sharpling is giving these. Well, if they didn't have if they didn't have uh hot dog no one no one i forget the fucking line you know the line where he's talking about like if there weren't if people didn't make mistakes then we wouldn't have hot dogs or something like that it's a fun line for for greg but you know tom sharp sharpling is delivering it in a broad cartoony way and then you have estelle just going i lost the battle of wills <laughs> it's, it's it's good it's a good bit every time um and uh <laughs> yeah so um and I think um, I, I think that narrative in the show is really interesting, how it's about this. Um, yeah, and I wonder if, you know, maybe Jesus is the ultimate parental apology. Because <laughs> it's like God sends himself down and he sees how fucked up it is. And then he's like, my bad. But not really. That doesn't really happen in the Bible. But it does feel like there is there is a, a change in character from the Old Testament God. After all, the Jesus stuff happens, uh, becomes a little uh, more forgiving or, you know, the God becomes less of the Jewish God where it's like, God is great. Anything can happen to you at any time. And God is still great to one where, no, God is love. God is forgiveness as long as you accept him, you know, uh, or as long as, you know, there is... Um, yeah, there is a there is forgiveness, basically. There is someone who will be easy on you and is not just hell bent on playing with you because they were your creator. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I, I think, uh, I, I think what's interesting about this show, um, is how influential it is and how it sort of, it came out of a, another show, which is very much not about forgiving your parents, which I, I, Adventure Time has the great sequence where uh, Finn meets his dad and his dad is played by the wonderful Stephen Root and Finn wants to reconcile more than anything else and his dad's a real fucking asshole <laughs> and he can never do it. I, I love that aspect of it. I, I mean, Finn meets his mom eventually and his mom is cool even though, you know, she's sort of manipulative in her own way. But um, I, I sort of like that aspect about Adventure Time because it is... Uh, how much more like life you want to do something you want to reconcile with your parents but they just might be no good you know they just might be they just might be Stephen Ruth's in, in like Stephen Root asshole mode uh, that that sort of stock character he plays like Fuchs and Barry infusing that sort of pathetic asshole character that he he, he can play so well um, into the narrative 
Um, so it's interesting that you go from this show, which has sort of maybe not more cynical or even realistic take, but one that is uh, very much not about, you know, no portion of Adventure Time really is dedicated that much to trying to forgive your parents, you know, maybe trying to forgive your friends or something like that. It's much more of a friendship show than a parent show. And uh, actually, uh, I guess there is some parent forgiving with Jake and his plot, also with Tom Sharpling, who's, who plays Jake's brother in that show. Um, and uh, But yeah, it, it is very much not about that, whereas it's a huge, major theme in Steven Universe. I would say the major theme in Steven Universe is uh, reconciling with a problematic parent and trying to and and through doing that you save the universe <laughs> through your reconciliation with your uh stubborn or bad parent you have managed to save everybody <laughs> which is i think like there's no bigger like everything everywhere all at once is, is sort of that trope again but steven universe was the first to do it on this just gigantic galactic scale uh, intergalactic scale of parental reconciliation I'm sure there was there are examples before this, uh, but um, yeah, to me, I, if I were to mark any starting point for this subgenre, it would probably be Steven Universe. And I, I mentioned the zealous fan base before, um, and also the zealous fan base for everywhere, everywhere, all at once, everything, everywhere, all at once. And something about this fantasy really gets their hooks into people. I think a desire that a lot of us have, you know, especially queer people who uh, obviously saw a lot of uh, themselves and the Joy character in EEAAO and Steven Universe is, you know, very queer, lots of queer themes in Steven Universe. Um, there is always this burning desire to be accepted by your parents, you know, because you are just in a situation where due to an immutable characteristic, there's a chance that you will be rejected by them for for no good reason so i think there is this and even you know after you come out even if your parents are sort of tacitly accepting of it you you may sense sort of a a, a low-key hostility or like a difficulty of them to like really truly accept or sort of a discomfort that they're working through and you're glad you're working through they're they're trying to work through it but you still wish it wasn't there and um so I think that desire to have full acceptance from your parents and for them to say sorry is like, I, I, of course that's a fantasy. Of course you want the thing that created you and that makes a gigantic part of you up. Of course you want to believe that that thing accepts you because, you know, it, otherwise there's half of me or there's if, if both of your parents are fucked up about you, there's all this parts of me are inherently against me the the things that make up my physical makeup uh, the, what they how they made other people before those people reject me and there's something really fucked up about that you know there, there's something about being torn asunder by the creator just like in in prometheus if they would create us why would they want to destroy us you know, you know? um yeah, the idea of being a mistake or unwanted or feeling like there is literally no place for you in this universe because you are an aberration. And uh, and so I get why this fantasy gets its hooks into people, because something this fantasy says to people is that, no, there is a place for you in the universe. You are not rejected by the creator. The creator can be reasoned with, and it can be um, you can work with it in order to create something good for everyone else. You know, and uh, of course you want to believe that. Because uh, also, you know, I, I, whether or not you want it, if you, most people, I can't say most people, but a lot of people, before they run into problems with their parents in their teenagehood or, or stuff comes up, if you don't have some sort of like a serious attachment disorder thing, you probably have these very early, very foundational memories of your parents taking care of you which you associate with, uh, you know, this pure sort of, you know, Freudian pleasure in a way, you know, everything being served to you all at once. Uh, you know, it's funny, I saw this interview with Hidetaka Miyazaki, 
uh, of of the Dark Souls uh, franchise. And he was talking about Guinevere in the first game, who is this giant woman who is sort of this symbol of acceptance and hope. And he was going on in the interview about, you know, isn't that we all want? We just want a giant woman to take care of us. You know, we just want a giant woman to like resemble what our parents once were to us, what our mothers and fathers once were to us is uh, these sort of all powerful entities that had nothing but our constant maintenance in mind you know there is some part of the lizard brain that sort of base instinct that strives for that it's sort of um and of course in steven universe you have i want a giant woman i want you to be a giant woman you know these these uh, you're always dealing with these big ass matriarchs or the desire to like see these like big ass parent or parental figures um because there is a comfort in returning to that infantile state. Um, and uh, I, and not, not saying that indulging this fantasy is also returning to an in- infantile state, but you know, I, I think the word fantasy is of use as well, because I think Rebecca Sugar in interviews about Steven Universe talks about how it is fantasy. And she even agrees with the criticism with, yes, of course you can't reason with, you know, genocidal maniacs in real life. But this is a fucking fairy tale, basically. Yeah, it's a fairy tale that has intense moments and, you know, it has, you know, allusions to real world stuff and, like, bad shit happens in it. But it is a fantasy at the end of the day. And there is absolutely nothing wrong with having a fantasy that makes you feel good. But, you know, don't get lost in it and pretend it's it's something that will happen because uh, you might get disappointed when it won't. Um, and, <laughs> and uh, uh, yeah, Emily Emily St. James in, in her article goes on to talk about the problems with this apology fantasy um, and how it's sort of limited, especially in realms of queer acceptance. Because, you know, for, for a lot of queer people, stuff like everything everywhere all at once does happen their parents do have a big revelation or if not a big revelation eventually become less bitter over the course of time or or some sort of propaganda gets to them or some something something happens to them which precipitates a change but more more often than not when (laughs) i i I keep saying these big proclaiming statements but the corollary to like a, a uh, an unaccept an initially unaccepting parent that eventually accepts you is you have the parents that will just never fucking accept you <laughs> at all which is a lot of them there's a lot of them out there and much in the same way that the song don't worry be happy if you're feeling particularly miserable or depressed and you hear that song it will just hit you terribly and you'll become angry, <laughs> angry, angry because it's like, ah, oh, Bobby, Mc- I can't be happy right now, Bobby McFerrin. Yeah, I, I may have to litigate. That sucks. How can you tell me not to worry, Bobby McFerrin? <coughs> in, in the same way, I think that if you're going through uh, something with a parent that will never forgive you or is, is far from the character of, of Evelyn and everywhere, everything, everywhere all at once, you know, is, is dissimilar from that character. I think that movie can hit really badly because if you have not had a parent that has had that revelation, um, then it can sort of like be a little twist of the knife as well. (coughs) But I think, you know, you can still hold on to hope that your parents will eventually get better and they won't dislike you or, or judge you for an immutable characteristic so much. There's nothing wrong with that either. Um, but, you know, don't don't pin all your hopes on it because, you know, they're different. They're, they're, they're people who are separate from you and you can't control what they think as much as you'd like to. Um, I guess I can talk about my own experience with both of my parents who, uh, uh, my mom listens to the podcast. Uh, I don't think my dad does, but, um, I won't say anything too untoward about them, but, um, my mom to, to her immense credit has really worked on herself. Like 
to me, I, I, it's interesting because I have either examples of a parent who really, I have one who really worked on herself and like made the effort to try and be more accepting and less uh, pain inducing. You know, she had that measure of self awareness, and you know, she went to therapy for years because you know she had she had big problems with her parents. You know, talk about reproducing cycles of generational abuse or whatever, but. She was able to get out of it, and as you know, she says, or what she learned from therapy, is go meta, which is sort of enter this third-person mode where you're observing yourself from, like, a camera and being like, why am I behaving like this right now? What is precipitating this behavior? And, you know, just figuring out how to do that. A lot of people never figure out how to do that and as such are sort of incapable of self-improvement, but she figured it out. But I had, like, I had problems with my mom because she has that, you know, very stereotypical traits of a Jewish mother. You got to work. You got to be a lawyer. You got to initially she was like that. She had this very strong sense of like, you have to embark a professional career. You have to use your brain for something very specific, but something that might not necessarily be within your, your personality or your wheelhouse, because there is an element of prestige or if you're not sort of making money, uh, off of your, uh, off of your talents then you know it's it's not you're you're sort of wasting a lot of time which um you know I, that's sort of an uh, sort of an unfair characterization i'm sure she would dispute some of those things but um uh a lot of it comes down she had like a lot of money anxiety too because during her marriage with my dad that was like it was always a big issue it wasn't making a ton and they were raising a kid together and they were buying a bunch of shit for me and trying to like be super parents but as a result it didn't uh there was never enough money around so she developed this really strong sense of money anxiety and that sort of colored a lot of her uh, treatment of a lot of her negative there were tons of positive it's not all negative like i don't want to make myself out to seem like any sort of abused child or anything when the, uh, the opposite is true but you know it, like if you, your your parent is doing something that is psychologically harmful even if they don't mean to you know it can fuck you up even if it w is within the normal realm of like psychological harm uh, that you just absorb from your parents naturally and she realized this. I think, you know, part of her uh, money anxiety, too, also meant that she she had this strange sort of transactional view of relationships that I think a lot of us have, because when you operate under capitalism, you start viewing favors and gifts and social graces as some form of transaction. So, um, and, you know, she, she's getting out. She, like, is in this constant process of getting out of it. But what that process looked like was there was no big singular revelation. There was no like moment like in the movies where, you know, uh, uh, they, they suddenly, you know, come to the realization that everything can be solved through love. You know, they do the, the Wong Kar Wai shot <coughs> and, you know, uh, they, they come to this notion that we should treat each other with universal kindness because uh, the world is absurd and, and thus, you know, uh, we should attack it with the absurdity of positive feelings. <coughs> um, and, but that isn't what it's like. You know, when a parent reconciles, it's, they get a little better, then they say something fucked up and you argue, and then they get a little better again. And then, you know, that's, that's how it works. It's like the old adage from uh, Seinfeld about doing a breakup. It's like knocking over a Coke machine. You don't get it on the first try. You know, you got to rock it around a few times before you finally, finally knock it down. Um, I, I think on the other side of this, um, you have my other parent who it's been much more difficult to reconcile with. I'm friendly with him every day, but the problem with my dad is that he believes in things that are counter to my existence as a queer person. You know, he's gotten really sort of Q-pilled as of late. He loves Jordan Peterson. Uh, he has an axe to grind uh, with queer people because he's bought the propaganda about grooming and such. So um, that process is a lot more difficult because, you know, th there's nothing... There's nothing I can say to him. There will be no universal cosmic thing that breaks him out of this prejudice, you know? 
It's not going to, it's just at, at this point, he's too old and entrenched in his views, which only came about recently, I guess, but I don't really see him giving up. He's sort of addicted to that sense of entitlement that conservative politics allow you to feel as a mediocre cis white man. <laughs> I'm talking a lot of smack about him. I love my dad, but it is very difficult to relate to a parent that, uh, or to try and like make good attempts to reconcile with a parent who, in the back of their head, sort of sees you as subhuman. You know, when you t ask them about it or you press them on it, they'll say, of course I don't see you as subhuman. Or, you know, they'll say something weird like, well, if God rejects you at the gates, then I'll go to hell with you, which is a nice enough sentiment, but... You believe God is going to reject me to begin with. It's such a weird, you know, you know, have your religion and everything. But it's like if it causes you to see this entire group of people as, as you know, lesser than or worthy of eternal damnation or punishment who haven't done anything, then it's like it's poisoning your brain and making you a worse person. Um, And, you know, that's another aspect of like, how do you like... Evelyn in Everything Everywhere All at Once isn't religious, you know. She can be reasoned with in that way because she doesn't really have strong convictions in uh, in trying to reconcile uh, it, it with her. You know, you don't have to beat back thousands of years of church dogma, you know. At least Steven Universe, there's like this big holy moment, <laughs> you know, at least we sort of understand that uh, the diamonds are this representative of this sort of uh, ecclesiastical uh, order of, of spreading their diamond life to everybody. So we understand sort of the long baggage of, of superiority complexes that they've had over the course of thousands of years, you know, which to me sort of resembles a lot more of the relationship you have with a difficult parent than necessarily the, the one in EEAAO, which, you know, that that's only my personal experience. I'm sure tons of people can relate to the, the dynamics in EEAAO, obviously, because it was super popular and won every award. And, um, but yeah, the, the thing about, I, I would like to see maybe as like an antidote to this narrative, and something that I've been toying around with myself, something that I've wanted to draw as sort of an autobio comic or something is like, it's not that you reconcile with a parent that is sort of has a moral compunction against your your personality or your body or your spirit or identity. You know, it's um maybe understanding that they're more than just this worst part of themselves. Even if all of their life they were like that, maybe there is some aspect of them that, even if it still rejects you, you know, was worth seeing and was worth saving and was worth understanding about your parent. Or the one story that I can think of and what I want to draw about is like just losing touch with my dad over these years. And also, you know, it's not that I lost touch with him, but it's just that he became a much more angry and difficult person i'm sure a lot of it has to do with the fact that he's he's doing elder care right now for my grandmother and that's in, that's incredibly difficult on him but um it's um it's also just uh, this wave of conservative media that just however like bitter or rage-filled he was before like this has given per him permission to do that so now he does it with this sort of gleeful abandon without noticing that it's like uh, i don't know ruining his life and relationships in my opinion um but um the story that i always think about or sort of these the moment that i think about which uh you know i still love my dad for is i remember when i was a child he'd go to this go-kart rally you know um, my dad was always trying to get me to uh, pursue more traditionally masculine hobbies or interests go-karts sports you know batting cages but i'm like a nerdy little kid i like musicals you know i like the the th one thing that we sort of had in common was music 
and video games. Weirdly enough, I guess not weirdly enough, it's easy to like video games, but well, my mom didn't encourage video games habits. She saw it as brain rotting. You know, my dad loved video games. He, he tells an old story of uh, I'm I'm apparently two years old in this story, and I've gotten on the basement computer and I'm playing Return to Castle Wolfenstein, and I have a bottle hanging out of my mouth, and I've wasted all my ammo, and my character is at a very low amount, and I'm just stabbing with this knife. And my mom is going down to the basement. She's doing laundry, and she discovers me as a toddler with this bottle hanging out of my mouth, stabbing with this digital knife. And she yells at my dad, for this, "Ah, this is horrible!" Um, some of that story, I find it hard to believe. I I knew instinctively what to do as a toddler in order to play Wolfenstein. Maybe I, I had seen my dad play it and emulated him. But um, but yeah, even since the very beginning, it was sort of like. Uh, in encouragement, eh, video games are kind of fun. I sort of like them, so this is something I can do with you. Um, and another thing that we had in common was The Simpsons. We both loved The Simpsons. You know, I loved it because it was a cartoon. I was a kid. It was the '90s. It was in vogue. It was some of the best episodes. Everybody loved the fucking Simpsons, right? Um, and so. I'm at this go-kart rally with him. You know, he was trying to do activities, do fun father-son activities to his credit. I'm terrible at it. You know, I'm crashing into the walls every second, every every few seconds. He's sort of like, he's quashing his disappointment a little. <laughs> you know, he, I can tell he's like, you know, I can't get him to catch a fucking ball. Can't get him to throw a spiral. You know, <laughs> you know, can't get him to do go-karts. You know what? What is this kid for? But in the in the lobby or one of the rooms back when sort of arcades in the '90s were still something that you could find pretty much everywhere. Uh, there were lots and lots of arcades around, lots of quarters that you could be putting into various beat 'em up machines. There was one of the the best arcade games of all time, in my opinion, which was the Simpsons beat 'em up game. Uh, the Konami Simpsons up beat em up game where you would go through various levels in order to get Maggie back who had been stolen by uh, uh, Smithers. And uh, the thing about this game or the thing about uh, beat em up games is that uh, they're usually for these arcade systems, there was no console port of it. So the only experience you would have with it would be in the arcade itself. And so... I had only I had played this game a few times, but I had never had enough quarters to get to the final levels or uh, experience what all the game had to offer. And so it's like it's like a big deal when you get past to where you've been before in one of these quarter eating beat em up machines, because frequently, especially as a kid, there were no let's plays. I couldn't watch any game footage. I was seeing all of this game footage for the first time. Um, and uh, so me and my dad are like. Okay, let's eh, let's kill some time, play the Simpsons video game, and eventually, we're we're getting to a point in it where we're sort of at the last initial round of quarters he bought, and then we just have this moment where we look at each other and it's like, do you want do you want to beat this game? I'm, I might buy like twenty dollars a quarters in order to beat this game. I'm like, Dad, I I would really like that. I would really enjoy that a lot, and that's what he did. And we beat the goddamn Simpsons arcade game. And it was beautiful for me. I saw the big bowling ball enemy. I saw the kabuki guy enemy, which I had never seen before. We fought the bear. You know, like, I, I never known what this game had had to offer. And not only that, it was, like, this real sense of accomplishment I had with my dad, too. Like, it was difficult to do stuff together, um... You know, because I was averse to all these traditionally masculine activities. But this was something that we actually accomplished and beat together and you know i remember that feeling of satisfaction because my dad who is an unusually chatty person you know all the time he's he's talking you know he was uncharacteristically silent on the ride home i think because i don't know there was some sense that and we really achieved something and there was no need for chatter even if it was just spending 20 bucks on a video game we got to the end of something and it felt like a I don't know, somehow a profound experience, at least to me. And, you know, that's one memory which really sticks out in my head. And that's the way I sort of experience, like, a, a problematic parent. Or I won't go so far as to say abusive, but one who is sort of against your interests and who has something against you is that 
you see good aspects of them and you see things that you've done with them that you cherish because they hold some emotional value for them. And at the same time, you just are filled with this sense of utter futility and sadness that this person who you once had this experience with, um, they, they aren't like they were anymore and they're more against you. And, um, I would like to see like uh, I, I would like to see a movie or something that explores this feeling a little more, that sort of tension between the beautiful memory you have of somebody and how they are currently behaving, you know. Um, I always think that's uh, I, I, I think that might be maybe something more potent, maybe a little more potent to explore. Maybe, maybe not. There, I, I, yeah, I don't think there's anything wrong with the parental apology genre. Um, I think why it's so big now is is sort of an interesting question. Like, is it just that Steven Universe set off like this uh, journey of a thousand uh, parental apology ships, or is it there's something in the zeitgeist which makes us believe that this parental reconciliation is possible? And not only is it possible, it is the key to solving all of our problems. And if I had to guess, or if I had to venture any sort of, like, material reason for it, it would be because, uh, as a millennial, you have these parents who are boomers. And maybe not your own individual parent, but you can absolutely see how your parents, through essentially no fault of their own, through consuming how they were taught to consume, have destroyed the planet and have made the world markedly worse for you. And, you know, your parent is not at individual fault, but their generation is. And so um, and there's lots of elements in media that try and set up generational warfare as this thing. So I, I think we're really keyed in to this idea of generational warfare. But it, it's different than, say, like the generational warfare of Vietnam, where the parents' generation was sending the kids to die. You know, that I think the difference between now and previous generations is it seems like this warfare is more imminently solvable, or we can talk it out. Uh, there does seem to be something that is more graspable and and just, you know, tantalizingly out of reach, which is why I think this fantasy is so popular, because it, like, it really seems like it should be possible, but frequently it isn't. <laughs> and, um... You know, maybe that's how we'll end. I, maybe I'll, I'll talk about I'll talk about Hades a little bit, um, just because I've been playing that. And it's funny that this other big piece of zeitgeisty material, this huge, absolutely huge, incredibly well executed video game, is also about getting your dad, who is the god of hell, <laughs> who is the god of the underworld, pretty scruffy guy, pretty mean guy. You know, eventually forging a bond with him and getting him to accept you. And I like this version of parental acceptance because it seems somehow more realistic to me because the way you go about parental acceptance in this case is by murdering your father <laughs> over and over again uh, with, with no real consequence because he just comes back to life. And I think if I got to murder my parents uh, with no consequence and we just come back to life again, I think we could really hash stuff out. <laughs> I think that's maybe a more realistic <laughs> portrayal. <laughs> somehow a somehow more realistic portrayal of how we want these sort of denouements or parental reconciliations to go so anyway love i still love both of my parents you know um whatever i do even even if like they do things that upset me you know i think that's the other thing is like you're just motivated in your greatest in in one of the deepest instincts you have to love your parents because they initially provided for you, as I said, but, you know, you can conjure up memories, examples of how they loved you, and, you know, it's hard to fight against those. So, yeah, I, I think it's it's a lot more tense. <laughs> if, if we're going to continue this parental reconciliation genre, I would like to see it have more of its nuance explored and maybe some of the ways that I've addressed here. I don't think it's, like, bad or anything. Uh, I think it's uh, interesting that it's taken root in the culture right at this moment. Uh, but
but uh, we'll see how it goes. We'll see if maybe E-E-A-A-O was the last gasp of this thing. I don't think so, actually. I think, uh, I think not. I think we're going to see a lot more of these in the future. So buckle up and have an excellent day.